Welcome to episode five of our new pop-up talk show, Means of Creation. In this show, we are interviewing founders and operators who are building tech companies that help people to do what they love for a living. I'm your host, Legion, along with Nathan Vachez. And we started this show because we wanted to encourage innovation in the passion economy and help the world to become a place where people can unite their passions and with their professions. And hopefully by shining a light on the innovators and thinkers in this space, we can help inspire more founders and creators who are forging their own paths. So our guest today is Nathan Berry, who is a creator, author, speaker, designer, and the founder of ConvertKit. He founded ConvertKit in 2013 as an email marketing company for creators with the goal of helping more people to make money online and features include landing pages for creators, email forms, and email automation. The company has been bootstrapped to 23 and a half million in ARR and now has over 31,000 customers. And Nathan actually got his start as a creator himself. He started writing a blog in 2011, built up an email list of 800 people, and then published an ebook in 2012 on how to design iPhone apps, which did $12,000 of sales in the first 24 hours. And thus ConvertKit was born to help creators with email marketing and to help them grow their email lists. A quick plug that this show is brought to you by the Everything Newsletter Bundle, which you can find at everything.substack.com. And a quick note before we dive in that for the first 30 minutes of the show, we'll have a conversation with Nathan, and then for the rest of the time, we'll switch over to audience questions. So if you think of any questions that come to mind as we're speaking, just feel free to put it in the Q&A, and we'll address them during the latter half of the show. So without further ado, let's dive in. Thank you so much, Nathan, for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Awesome. I'd love to start with getting from your own voice, what is ConvertKit? I think a lot of people have heard of you, have heard of ConvertKit. It's often mentioned in the landscape of creator tools. But for those in the audience who aren't as familiar with it, would love to hear you describe what ConvertKit does and how the vision of it has really evolved and changed over time. Yeah, so... ConvertKit is an email marketing platform for creators. Um, so in the early days, you know, we're competing with MailChimp and Aweber and Infusionsoft tools like that. Um, it's really, it's used by a range of creators. So instead of going wide and going after like all of small business or something like that, like other tools do, we've narrowed in on creators and gone from the beginner who just wants to get started with, um, you know, launching a, a new creative project. They need to spin up a landing page and start capturing email subscribers. Um, or launch a new newsletter, something like that, all the way through to like the biggest creators in the web. I was actually reading a bunch of books and, you know, it's like you've got James Clear as a customer and uh, Tim Ferriss and um, Gretchen Rubin and Tim McGraw and uh, Brian Holiday and so many others. So ConvertKit now powers, I think, most of the largest uh, newsletters on the web. Um, and, and then it's really designed, you know, so you could as a creator, start on one platform and grow all the way through from getting your first 10 subscribers up to, you know, one, two, three million uh, subscribers and go from there. So that's the idea behind ConvertKit. When I started it, because as you mentioned in 2012, I, I got into uh, designing iPhone apps and, and then teaching and blogging. And, and um, I remember this distinct time where I would so, started selling my book on how to design iPhone apps and it had done really well. And all the sales came from email. And I was like, this is incredible. And I went to a few friends who knew online marketing. I was like, did you know, like email converts higher than all the social channels combined? And they're just like, yes. We've known <laughs> that since like 2002. Like, <laughs> welcome to the party. I don't, I don't know. What do you want me to tell you right now? <laughs> and so I was that person in 2012 going around and be like, email is incredible. Like, um, everyone has to be using this. But then at the same time, I ran into the problem that none of the best practices were built in it was really hard to uh, give away incentives to grow a list, like a sample chapter or a free course or any of that. The automations didn't really make sense. If you wanted to get into these more advanced tools, they were super complicated, like an Infusionsoft or a MeroPost or some of these, um, and they didn't scale super well. And so it was like, how can we have a tool that's built for creators that scales with them, um, that's still easy to use? Right. Uh, and so that's how ConvertKit started. Uh, it's been seven and a half years now, and I think... Now we're like starting to really live out that mission, which is pretty fun. 
That's amazing. Just hearing stories of like my wife running email campaigns for Hillary Clinton's campaign and the software they had to use. I mean, it gets complicated. Right. So I can only imagine, I can only imagine uh, what, what sort of like management it requires to, to do that kind of stuff. And then, you know, it's, it seems like that's like kind of the key thing from the, from the origin of ConvertKit is like, you don't have to have like some sort of like professional manager, like just to operate software. Like you can like write your stuff and then go to the right. software and like it works and you, but you still have all the powerful stuff like automations. Yeah. And, yeah. So like a great example of that would be uh, Tim Ferriss. You know, he's got, I think he's publicly said he's well over a million email subscribers. Um, you know, and so he has the reach of like a good sized magazine. You know, if you think about <laughs> like, they should have a big office and a high rise in uh, Manhattan, you know, and all this stuff. Right. And there should be like, 50 people and they're running all this stuff and doing a sponsor and all that. Nope. It's Tim, his head of marketing and his assistant whole team, you know? And so ConvertKit is a tool that lets you basically do that of have that, you know, that huge impact and powerful reach and then still like just run it as if it was a, a small list and, you know, an, an easy, simple team. It's really funny hearing you um, describe the aha moment of realizing that email marketing was so effective at selling things. I'm wondering if you think the landscape has changed since then in terms of email and its efficacy. Everyone has been recently talking about newsletter fatigue and how they're subscribed to so many email newsletters and it's just overwhelming and it's gotten too noisy. And obviously also, I think one of the things that has changed since the early days of email marketing has been, there's now platforms like Gmail, which sort your email into different buckets. Right. And like the bane of a newsletter writer's existence is to be lumped into the promotions folder and how do they get out of the promotions folder? Um, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on you know, do you still think of email as being a critical tool in the creator's toolbox? Yeah. So um, email's demise, I think, has been predicted every year for the last 20 years. Um, somebody did a thread that was really fun where they basically like, uh, I don't remember what they were graphing, but, you know, the growth of email, email marketing, that kind of thing. And then like overlaid it with all the, you know, Forbes and entrepreneur and um, New York times and everybody talking about email is dead, you know, like right. every six months for the last 20 years. And it's so you're like, like, are we in a startup bubble? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, and you can have these things where, um, when you're pushing for attention, you know, and, and like, right, they're asking a question and the, the, the answer to the question continually is no, it turns out that email is not dead. And so you end up with these new waves, right? Where for a while people were like, oh, maybe the newsletter is dead. And then over the last two years, in particular, the newsletter has just seen a ridiculous rise. And then that comes to people who are like, okay, well, now I'm, I'm overwhelmed by newsletters. And maybe we're giving someone a hard time like, oh, you're starting another newsletter. And it's like, well, okay, that's how it feels when you're like us. When you're at the hub of it all and we talk about Substack and ConvertKit and newsletters and open rates and engagement and all that stuff all day, every day. And it's like, well, yeah, if you surround yourself with people who are writing newsletters, then you might feel like 30 or 40 newsletters is too many, but, you know, we might have newsletter fatigue. I think the person who's been following a journalist for quite a while and that journalist goes independent and starts their own newsletter and they start following that, I don't think that person is feeling newsletter fatigue. If we go beyond the, I don't know, 30, 50,000, 100,000 of us that are creating newsletters and we go to hundreds of millions of people in the U S and then billions beyond that, then like, no, I don't think newsletter fatigue is real. Um, I think that in, in our bubble, it may be real. Um, yeah. but beyond that, what we're finding is it's just such an incredible way to engage with true fans. Like if, if anyone's uh, ever read Kevin Kelly's 1000 true fans, like he could have put an addendum on there of like, and just do it with a newsletter. There's no better platform. Um, cause it will set you up for such long-term success. Totally. Right. Yeah. Totally. I think we are all disciples of a thousand true fans. <laughs> so. And it's like with, yeah, totally. And it's like with every form of media, it's like, oh, there's so many like shows or like, oh, I have this big pile of books I've been meaning to get to. And then like the right one comes out that you're actually truly pumped about. And all of a sudden it doesn't feel like you have fatigue. It feels like you can't, you're so pumped that this new thing came out that you love so much. Right. Um, and like, I mean, books, I feel that way. There's endless numbers of books to read you know, but I Book just, fatigue. I, I, yeah, exactly. But I just buy audible credits and 24 pack bundles and, you know, I go on runs and sure enough, you know, knock out another book. And it's like, 
there's plenty of time to consume the right content and the best stuff floats to the surface. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, I'd love to also get your thoughts on, you know, ConvertKit was started in 2013, which was at the very nascent stages of even being an online creator. And since then, there's now been the rise of influencers, which I don't even think was a a word back in 2013. There's now lots of massive social platforms where people are building an audience and making a living, lots of vertically focused platforms like Teachable or Substack. Um, I'm curious to get your thoughts on what have been, you know, some of the biggest changes for creators in terms of being able to make a living in the last decade and what, what has, what they need to focus on changed or stayed the same since then? Yeah. So, okay. Things that have stayed the same, um, email, let's see, great writing, email, and the value of search engines, I think have entirely stayed the same. All right. And so if we go back to some friends here in Boise who, you know, we're the ones saying like, yeah, we've been doing this since 2002, right. They've been using those exact tactics. Um, what has started to change is, I mean, the tools are so much better now, right. In 2012, when I was starting out, it was like, should I use MailChimp, Aweber or Infusionsoft, you know, and those were the options. And so as you fast forward from that, like now there's so many great platforms. Now you you're trying to decide between Substack or ConvertKit and uh, maybe Active Campaign or something like that, like uh, or like Ghost, right? And you have these platforms being made, like tailor made for creators. And you're like, this isn't a bad place to be. Like as an individual, you're like, I'm choosing between good options. Okay, cool. Whereas, you know, um, eight ten years ago, you were choosing between bad options. The same is true on the commerce side of how you're going to earn a living. You know. Um, Gumroad, for example, came out in 2012. Um, that's the platform that I started launching on. Um, uh, Stripe was before that, obviously, but not that much earlier. And so the biggest shifts have been that you really have great options for platforms to get up and running quickly. You know, before Gumroad, like you sell through PayPal or eJunkie, like yeah. those, <laughs> those were your options. And, you know, you, you don't have good choices. And so now what's changed is that, or if we overlay like, those constants that we mentioned and what's changed. Um, What you realize is that now you don't have to worry nearly as much about platform Mm -hmm. because there aren't, there's so many better options. And instead you focus on uh, a great engagement with your fans and creating great content on a consistent basis. And so the world is actually, it might feel like there's more choices, but what you should do as a creator has actually simplified quite a bit because you can focus on delivering that value rather than all the things necessary to get the value to the reader, to the customer. Right. Yeah. I think that that is so true. And I think another major shift that has occurred since 2013 is the legitimization of creators as a channel to sell Mm, products through like, and advertising as one of the primary ways that people are able to monetize their fan base online. Um, I think in the past seven years or so there's been like all of the creators on Instagram are basically monetizing through sponsorships and brand deals. And that probably represents the bulk of their earnings. Yeah. And I think that depending on what industry you're in, the monetization, whatever monetization method is best is going to change. So for example, as if we're writing about tech or teaching design or any of those things, then there's probably going to be a higher revenue per subscriber. Um, Yeah. You know, a sponsorship is going to be a more difficult model um, w- compared to if I'm a, if I have a woodworking Instagram or YouTube channel, then like, hi, Home Depot, like, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's do a project together. Um, you know, I even have friends who are in that space who are like getting Lowe's to pay for their entire house remodel because they did a 10 part video series on it, you know? Right. So sponsorship comes a lot more naturally there. Um, my model, just because of the spaces I've played in has always been, like a direct sales, like ask, you know, sell an ebook, sell a course, um, subscription, any of that directly to the customer. And that's been my yeah. favorite. Um, it just, yeah. it also makes it clear who the customer is. Cause in other cases, right. If I'm an influencer in that sense, and you're following me, you're actually the product and the customer is, you know, whatever fashion beauty brand, uh, you know, I'm sponsoring or that kind of thing. Right. Um, and the follower is the product. Whereas if you're selling to the followers, then they're the customer. Um, and the product is the thing you're delivering to them. Yes. 
Yeah, and I think it, it the monetization model not only hinges on the industry that you're playing in, but also on your audience size, I think. Where if you're a smaller creator with a smaller base of followers, you know, there's no way in the world that you could monetize through advertising and actually make a living. Right. Whereas if you're an influencer with a million followers, advertising might be the lowest effort way to actually create income for yourself versus writing an ebook. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think that, um, that's very normal for people to get into, but I would also encourage those people with a large, large audiences, like do the yeah. ebook, do the guide because the revenue per subscriber is going to be so much higher. But the nice thing is, is you can do both, you know, yes. you're not, you're not limited. The only, and it, it saves you from, you know, filling the site with ads. Maybe you do a little bit of sponsored stuff, but you do it in a really tasteful way instead of having to rely on it as your main channel. Totally. Yeah. There's like a portfolio of different products that you can monetize right. through and monetization methods. You, you don't need to just stick to one. Yeah. And there are companies like Fanjoy, which does merch for a lot of these influencers or like Mofi, which it's like if in the beauty, like vlogger space, like they'll, it's like their whole, I guess they're sort of like a umbrella brand for like specific brands that they create in partnership with influencers. So you're no longer, you know, an influencer that, that has an ad for makeup. You just like create a makeup line with this company, you sell it and you get right. a bigger percent of the cut and it's, you, you influence the actual product itself. Um, well, and that's something actually that I love. There's a post that I'm working on. Um, I don't know what I'm going to call it. Graduating to bigger upside, something. You see this thing where, someone builds an audience and maybe the first product that they're selling to it is sponsored uh, content, advertising, that kind of thing, right? And they're making a certain amount of money. Let's say that gets us to $5,000, $10,000, $20,000 a month in revenue. And as that audience grows, then maybe they're selling their own digital products or things like that um, or the combination. And you know, with large audiences, those, those get big. Like if we take, let's use a brand, uh, wellnessmama.com. So they're one of the most popular um, health and wellness, um, you know, parenting focused blogs on the internet. Um, I think they've publicly said there are seven or 800,000 email subscribers. Um, so this is massive. And that's like a, uh, now I'm guessing in numbers, but I would guess that it's a three to $4 million a year business um, that this one family is running, Seth and Katie. Um, and they're doing an incredible job with it. And so now you look at, okay, three to $4 million a year. That's, that's pretty impressive off of, you know, especially if someone was like, mm, blogging is not a legitimate business or something like that. You're like, ah, beg to differ. But then you look at, okay, what happens next? And what they did is they went and launched, like developed their own products lines. So they launched a company called Wellness. Um, I'm an investor in it. And that's them saying, we're building our own, you know, direct and consumer product brand. Yeah. And they basically, they reached the max upside on the direct to audience selling digital products, that kind of thing, which is in the, you know, single digit millions of dollars a year in revenue. But now they're on track to use that audience to launch what could be like the next like native deodorant or something, right? You're into the territory of, oh, you launched that direct, you know, uh, that consumer products brand way faster than anyone else because you already had hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. And you're on track for a hundred million dollar exit or something like that. Another example would be uh, Mark Sisson who did the blog Mark's Daily Apple he built Primal Kitchen and then sold it to Primal Kitchen is like a condiments um, company focused on the paleo space. Um, and he sold it um, to Kraft, I think for 200 million, somewhere in there. And you're like, it's not bad for a blog, you know? Yeah, and right? then he still has the core blog. So you see that happen a lot. You know, Glossier is the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. All of that, of taking an audience and then directing it towards something that has massive, massive upside. Yeah, I like that notion of graduating to the next big revenue opportunity. And I often, I think it's complementary to this idea that I often talk about where creators now have a portfolio of different mm -hmm. revenue options that they are cobbling together income from. It's not just a single source. They're writing eBooks, they're writing a newsletter, they might have merchandise, they're, they also have a Patreon. One of the biggest like pushbacks that I often hear from like analysts or you know commentators in the space is like each one of these platforms is paying creators so little like how are they possibly making an income like the average revenue per patreon creator is like nothing like no one's making an actual living and my response to that is 
yeah, but like, it's not designed to be your full income. It's designed right, right. to be a part of your income portfolio and creators actually want to diversify across a number of different revenue channels. So, you know, we're moving from this world in which all of your income came from one source, your employer, to a world in which you're actually assembling a diversified portfolio of income. Well, yeah, what's wild about this, right? So two years ago, ConvertKit, we rebuilt all of our e-commerce integrations. So with tools like Shopify and Gumroad and um, Teachable and everything like that. So instead of just passing over like, oh, this person's a customer, so you could customize your marketing, it passes over the revenue they spent and all of that. And that last two and a half years since that went live, um, we've tracked like $1.2 billion in sales that have happened across, you know, convert your customers selling products. And so you're like, I think there's something in this creator economy thing. I think yeah, these right. 30,000 um, convert your customers, you know, if we were to divide that out, like they're doing pretty well. 1.2 billion across that group, you know, it, you can earn a living here and uh, it, it'll work really well. Yeah. I'm curious how y'all think about the trade-off between like spreading yourself thin, right? Like where, okay, you maybe have diversified portfolio of, you know, uh, income streams versus like the value of focus, right? Because like Nathan, one thing we've talked about before is like you've compared like your focus to like you can build out where you're building like a strip mall or you can build up where you're you're building like a skyscraper and the skyscraper approach is better where you're very focused on one location and just keep investing in it um, to making making more progress faster, making audience and money. Um, Yeah. So it depends on what you're going after. Um, When you have a small subscriber base, I'm going to define that as say 5,000 subscribers and under, and we're just going to talk about email subscribers because that's what I love. And I think that's where you should focus anyway, but I'm not at all biased. Um, (laughs) uh, So with that, from a single product or from advertising, you're probably going to struggle to earn a full-time living. Let's define a full-time living as $75,000 a year, something like that, where it's like, okay, we could at least, we may not live super comfortably, but we could at least live in most cities, you know? Um, so as you're going for that, like 5,000 subscribers is enough to get to that, but you're going to need probably a couple different products to do it. Um, so you might need, um, Maybe you're doing some sponsored stuff on your podcast, but that's probably not bringing in more than maybe a thousand dollars a month. Um, you might have a book that's selling a, a few thousand dollars a month, um, but that's where you you probably also have like a coaching tier or something higher end, like a hands on where you're charging five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars for those biggest fans to really be involved with what you're doing um, to get you to that you know seven six seven thousand dollars a month that we need to that we need to hit. Um, and so if you need to reach that minimum viable income quickly, that's the model that I would go with. There's a couple different products and the audience size is small. If you're able to wait, let's say you have revenue coming in already from something else, or you're doing this on the side or you've built another income stream, then if you can get that first product out and then just go all in on audience growth, um, then that's the biggest upside. Yeah. So like I used James Clear as an example before, and he and I have been friends uh, and in a mastermind group together since 2011. And he, uh, or I guess 2012. Um, and he built an entire online business. I think he got to 10, 15,000, maybe 20,000 a month in revenue um, in order to learn search marketing, um, uh, writing habits, you know, blogging, all of that stuff. And then he took that whole thing, threw it away actually never talked about it again. Um, And then he started jamesclear.com and said, I'm going to build, you know, the largest um, or like the fastest growing single author newsletter of all time. And he just said, he was like, I don't care about making money from it. It's all about great content and great distribution. And that, you know, he focused all in on that. And he wasn't like, what products can I sell? What can I do here? Um, And he was relentless about it. And over time, you know, it was like he got to 10,000 subscribers really quickly and then 20 or 30,000 and then 50. And then, and then it wasn't very long before he was at a hundred, 200,000 subscribers. And, you know, we dove in and it was like, James, I think this is legitimately one of, if not the fastest growing single authored newsletter of all time. Like we couldn't find faster ones and, and I'm sure there's some out there, but, um, you know, now I think he's sitting, I think he said he's 600,000, 700,000, um, subscribers, Atomic Habits came out. It's it hit number one New York Times. 
you know, he's at the point where he's making millions of dollars a year just off book sales, forget $40,000 speaking fees. Um, and so he focused on growth and then first and then income later because he set himself up that he could do that. Right. So he built that skyscraper. Um, and, and that's the position that he, they put himself in. The conversation, uh, Nathan, that you and I had along with Dan was basically I was encouraging you guys um, instead of launching a bunch more newsletters quickly. Or like, like talk shows, like means of creation. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly we didn't follow. <laughs> well, no. you know, you can give advice, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but basically the point that I wanted to make to you guys is that the ceiling for any one thing is actually way higher, right? Cause you guys were getting into, I don't know, what did you have? 15,000 subscribers when, when we were talking something like that. Yeah. A few months ago. Um, and it's obviously grown quite a bit since then, but, um, of basically saying, Hey, the limit you shouldn't be like, cool, we got this one to where it should be. Let's launch the next one. You should go, what's the limit on this? And I'm telling you, the limit is 200, 300, 400,000 subscribers. Right. And if you go vertical and build that massive skyscraper, then you're going to have a way bigger audience, um, especially because right, you have the paid newsletter, so you're monetizing along the way and you don't have to make this trade off. I just wanted to make the point that the sky's the limit. Totally. I think this is, I, I'd love to delve more in, to this topic and specifically around like the best uh, monetization strategy for creators. And I wanted to specifically unpack this recent tweet that you made, which was yeah. quite controversial and got a lot of responses saying that um, basically there's an easier way for creators to make money um, and to get to hundred K in revenue. Uh, and it's, it's not paid newsletters. It's instead like courses, books, etc. cetera. Um, I think the tweet actually said, Paid newsletters are trendy right now, but most creators would earn far more if they focused on selling one-time products. There's a much clearer path to 100K per year from books, courses, et cetera, than from paid newsletters. So I'd love for you to unpack that and sort of explain the thinking there. Yeah, so when I first made the jump from selling my digital products to starting ConvertKit, I was like recurring revenue you know, it'd be amazing is actually like the same customer paying me every single month. And it, that was totally true, you know, and now ConvertKit's about to cross 2 million a month in revenue. And so it's like that paid off very, very well. My point with that tweet is that it's a very long game to play. Um, you'll find when you start any SaaS company that uh, churn is really quite high. If you were to ask what's good churn, people will say stuff like 2% or 3%, you know, um, and then what you find out in reality is that like for the first years of running a company, it's like 10% or 15% monthly churn. And it's absolutely brutal. And it's harder to make this one time or make this recurring sale versus a one-time sale. So it's not that one method of selling products is better than the other. It's that one is a harder than the other. And so for example, if we're trying to get to the point where um, we're earning that 75K or 100K a year from um, a small audience, I believe it's going to be way easier to do it with the books and courses. And I'm a bit biased because that's the path that I took, right? But with an audience of 5,000 people, um, I was able to relatively easily be earning a hundred, 150, $200,000 a year off of a couple, like a portfolio of um, digital products. And I think it would have been much harder for me to get to the point where I had um, say at a $10 a month or $15 a month recurring subscription, um, I think it would have taken me a lot longer to get to that 100K mark. And I mm -hmm. would have felt all the pain of churn. And um, I would have felt, you know, like that ongoing commitment Yeah, yeah. to show up every week. So the great thing is you can do both. It's not one or the other. And right. um, I firmly believe in paid newsletters as a platform. We're launching that same functionality directly on ConvertKit. Um, it's just, I think as people are looking for that minimum viable income, I think that they should switch their focus and do one-time products first and then roll into something subscription-based. How do annual plans factor into that? Because it solves a lot of, because you're right, you're definitely right. That's like, okay, cool. Like take $10 a month, $15 a month that like, you, you need a lot of people for that to add up to something. And once you get mm -hmm. it going, it's really powerful. But like, it's really nice if someone's willing to pay like a hundred bucks or 200 bucks up front for right. the year. Um, Cause you kind of, you can pull the cash flow forward and it makes yeah. it, it has more book-like properties. 
It does. And the, and the churn is way, way lower. So um, what I would do if I were to do an annual plan for a newsletter is I would position it that way and then throw in some, okay, so let me back up. My worry with that is that the payment happens up front and the value is delivered so gradually over time that people might say like, oh, this isn't enough value right away. I want to uh, cancel and get a refund. Like, you know, your two newsletters and they're like, ah, these two weren't that great. Right. Because they're, they're basing that on, right. They're like, I paid for 52 in these first two. And, you know, and as a writer, you're like, but there's going to be so much more to follow. Like look at this topic list that I have and everything else. Um, and so what I would do is I would focus on the annual plan. I love that idea. And then I would say for everyone who buys the annual plan in this window of time, right, we get mm-hmm. to do a product launch, then I'm going to do, uh, teach this workshop. I'm going to do this live Q and A, you know, like something that they're getting a ton of value up front, building that right. personal connection. Um, and then they're like, wow, I got, I paid the regular price and I got all this additional value. Um, and it lets you do a launch because this is the thing. If, if all of our, um, you know, new tech newsletter authors and all that pay attention to one thing from the, like the digital marketing uh, world, it's that like you should do open and close launches. You need urgency to get people to take action, right? That's why that they're doing, um, that's why you see the New York times or things, you know, running discounts or incentives, right? right? Like, right. Cause people need a reason to sign up today instead of next month or next year or forever. Um, so that's the model that I would do is I would try to find, I would focus on the annual subscription and I would try to find a way to deliver a ton of value upfront and make them feel special for signing up today. That's a great point. Also with the open and close launches, the best tactic for Substack newsletters is to just announce that you're going to be raising your price in like two weeks. Mm. Yes. Lock it in now. It works so well. The hard yeah. thing is that you can only raise your price <laughs> so much so before much. you yeah. <laughs> price it's being raised every market. single day. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but that is a valid point of, you know, if you started out, say, say you launched at $10 a month, you could go to 12 or $15 a month six months later when you're like, okay, I found my legs as a writer. Like I'm feeling good about this. And then every six months you keep bumping it up and right. saying like, look, my, now my free newsletter is for the people who are just checking out my content. But my paid newsletter um, is for like the true fans, especially if you're doing like an investor newsletter or a tech newsletter, like a hundred dollars a month is not unreasonable if you're delivering a ton of value. And so it's like, okay, if over the next five years, I'm going to go from $10 a month to a hundred dollars a month that is a lot of price increases that I have in my favor for launches. Yeah. With divinations, the price from the beginning was, was 20 back when it was a standalone newsletter. And, uh, but I launched with five and I'm like, Hey, like pretty much like every, every couple of weeks, I'm just going to keep raising the price as I right. kind of get my sea legs. And I, and I did that announcement a couple of times and there was sort of like diminishing returns. Cause I think like, the shock of like, oh, the price is increasing. Like the first time that becomes a concept in your head, you're more likely right. to act on it than like, oh, the price increased a couple of times and I haven't bought it yet. So like, I guess I'm right. just not going to buy this. At some point you like yeah. funnel people out and I kind of, it, it stopped working as well. But um, that's what I tried to do. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So I'd love to hear from the two of you. Um, you know, I've shared my perspective on that. What, what parts do you agree with on that? And where you're like, look, my experience says otherwise that uh, there's a better path to income. Well, I mean, I use my newsletter in the A16Z way. So at A16Z, we always joke that we were a media company that monetized through venture capital. And so the content that we put out was like very, very high quality. I think a lot of people wouldn't even call the A16Z content to be content marketing, but it really is content marketing for founders that we wanted founders to come to the firm, pitch us, like want us to share our expertise with them. And so it was done with the ultimate goal of driving deal flow and being the most sought after investor, but we didn't monetize the content at all. We monetized that through investing in the best deals and trying to have the highest returns as a VC. And that's what I'm still trying to do with my newsletter. Um, So the, the monetization method is investing rather Mm -hmm. than charging directly for the content. Now I've had multiple people come up to me and be like, you know, you're writing at the level of Ben Thompson or like there's very, very little content out there in the market that is this deep and thoughtful about tech. Like, why don't you charge for your newsletter? Like, 
I'm ready to pay you right now, or right. please write a book. And I just grapple with like short-term versus long-term monetization and like that tension between I want to reach everyone in the world, but like, how do I, you know, monetize this content? Should I even try to monetize it? And I, I guess I still haven't really figured it out. I've just decided to keep it free because I would rather everyone read it and understand my thoughts and influence as many people as possible versus monetize the content per se. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good point. Um, and there's not a right answer here, but I would ask the question as you're looking into how you're going to monetize, um, what gets me in front of more people and raises my personal brand and all of that um, versus what uh, has me going deeper with the existing people that I have. Totally. So for example, let's say I have 10,000 subscribers and I'm like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to launch a $2,000 course because I'm trying to make the most money. We're going to go deep in this. That is going to help me go deeper with the people that I have. But someone you know, just driving by on the internet is going to be like, that's yeah. not for me. Um, paid newsletter, depending on how you go about it, could be a deeper with your audience thing. Whereas right. a book is always, always, always a let me go broader with way more people. And so you go from, you know, one reason that I wrote my first book, uh, the app design handbook is that I wanted to raise my personal brand from like a blogger who randomly wrote about iOS design and stuff like that to being the guy who wrote the book on how to design iPhone apps. And so my brand, because I made that, that monetization choice, my personal brand skyrocketed. Now that was going from like 800 email subscribers to 5,000, but you know, Hey, I'll take seven X returns on that. You know? Um, so good to me. Yeah, exactly. So think about in your monetization choice, how does it feed into it? So Lee, for mm -hmm. you, I, if I were you, I would be all in on a book because it's going to elevate your brand so much and be playing that long game. And then whatever that topic is, if I'm a founder raising funds in the space that is related to your book and I'm like, uh, the round is closing. I've got room for you. Yes, you're in. Like, come <laughs> help me. You know, because your personal brand is so much higher because of the newsletter and then leveling up into the book. Yeah, it's interesting that books are still regarded as such a prestigious thing to do. Well, and the reason, right, is okay. So here on my desk, Derek Sivers, brilliant guy. I get to pay like fifteen dollars and read his best thinking from an entire decade of building a remarkable company. Like, and it's going to take me an hour and $15. Like that is such insane value. Um, because we know the quality is going to be there. We, you know, um, that that's why everybody cares about books because it's so much value condensed into an approachable format for so little money. Um, that, yeah, it's the format that everyone's like, cool. I see what you're doing there and, and I support it. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, maybe the last question that I wanted to ask you before we hand it over to the audience is like you have this, you know, personal philosophy of wanting the world to create more and consume less. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's even that piece of art behind you that says create, which I love. <laughs> Not a prop. It was already there. Um, yeah, I'm curious about encouraging people to create more and consume less is awesome. And I very much also subscribe to that philosophy of I'm always challenging myself. How do I create more and consume less? So for the folks in the audience, um, how can people actually do that? It seems really hard um, in today's world where there's just content everywhere and consuming it is so much easier and more entertaining and relaxing than right. sitting down and creating something. So where do people even start when they want to become creators and not just consumers? Yeah. And that's such a good question. First, I would, um, I think it's best to identify the intention and actually explicitly state it. So like, as someone hears that, you know, for everyone listening now, think about it and go, is that my intention? Do I want to create more than I consume? And if you do, if that's what you want to do, I would grab a piece of paper, a sticky note and say, you know, my goal this week is to create more than I consume. And I would stick it to my monitor. And I would say, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. And then what kinds of things do I want to create? A lot of people might have that idea already. They've got their newsletter, they know their topic, something like that. And they're going towards it. Other people might be like, 
Uh, I could do a whole bunch of different things. So where I would start, if you're in that second camp, is I would start by documenting what you're doing and what you're learning. And so I would put um, two calendar reminders, you know, little 15, 20 minute meetings that show up maybe on, I don't know, Tuesday and Friday, something like that, that show up. And one of them is, um, so the Tuesday one, let's say it's, uh, what are you making? And a reminder to document that. Um, And the Friday one is, what did you learn this week? And so in that sense, like I could build an Instagram following just by like tweeting about, or not tweeting, uh, posting on Instagram about my woodworking projects. You know, what did I build? I, I, uh, remodeled a small thing on my house. I made this jewelry box, right? I have a wood shop and that's the thing that I love. I built this tiny house that I'm in, right? I could build a whole audience about tiny houses if I had followed that process and had that been my desire. Um, you know, just by posting on Instagram, you know, a couple times a week and telling the story and telling the progress and putting the right hashtags in. And that's, that's not hard to do. Like something, uh, my wife and I have a small homestead where we're at and, you know, we don't have a blog for it. We don't have anything, but we very casually post to Instagram and kind of build a following there and like document our progress. And so whatever that is, whether it's learning to program, launching a new VC firm, uh, what you're learning, angel investing, what you're learning, building a newsletter. This is the thing that I did as I built an audience around design. Um, I got a lot of traction from that, which is great, but I got just as much traction from blogging and teaching openly about what I was learning well, building the audience about design. People want to follow someone who's on a journey. And so if you are open about that journey, like ConvertKit started with a public challenge to build a software company to 5,000 a month in recurring revenue. I remember and that. A, a whole bunch of people followed that journey. I got calls from, uh, or emails and then offers for calls from people like Heaton Shaw and David Hauser who were like, hey man, if you need anything, just call me. You know, and I, I was a nobody, but that's because they saw that I was clearly on a path and they're like, oh, okay, well I can help them get there with advice. Um, and so that's what I would do. I would document your journey. And then at the end of every week, I would say, what did I learn this week? And I would write it out and it might be, um, something really simple or it might be something pretty, you know, pretty advanced and revolutionary. And, um, uh, I think those two habits will really, really kick it off. Yeah. I love that. I think people love seeing the process, not just the yes. end state. And sharing the process also helps you stay accountable because there's people who are following you and tracking your progress and are on the adventure with you. Yep. There's um, two sayings that I use. Or I'll go with three. There's sort of mottos, mantras, I don't know, for ConvertKit. Um, one of them is create every day. Like you have to show up consistently. Uh, my friend Sean McCabe talks about show up every day for two years. Of like this mm. is going to take time and just show up <laughs> consistently, chip away at it you'll make it happen. The second is teach everything you know. And that's an approach that I've embraced throughout building ConvertKit. So for example, um, you mentioned like our public barometrics page has all of our revenue and details on it. Um, that's been public since it was about $2,000 a month in revenue. Wow. You know, and it's now um, pushing $2 million a month. And so you look at like my goal with that is that any founder can go back and be like, I wonder what ConvertKit's churn was at when they were at my size company, which is 30,000 a month, or they can look into that and they can follow the whole yeah. journey. Um, and then the last one is default to generosity. And that's just always when you're thinking about, should I share this? Should I not like default to putting it out there? Um, like a post that I just published uh, on my blog earlier this week and out to my newsletter is like one of the most embarrassing business mistakes I've ever made, which cost me $500,000 was a super public name change, then rolling back the name change and all this stuff. Right. And I wrote a massive post about the whole thing. And, you know, so like, yeah, you put everything out there, share the wins. Yeah. And the that losses. was a crazy story. Yeah. Can you just recap it really quick for people who haven't read it? Cause I, I, I literally sent it to Lee before this and I was like, I sent it to a bunch of groups I'm in too. insane. This is like, <laughs> this is moving. It's moving, frankly. Cause like the connection of the name and what you did anyway, Tell the story yeah. real quick. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, early on in ConvertKit, it, it was a tool to help for email marketing, right? Convert visitors into subscribers and customers. And so the name made a lot of sense. And anyone who's trying to name something knows that you're just looking for an available.com, 
right? So you're putting all sorts of words together. And that worked, we ran with it. A few years later, we started to build this company for creators, you know? And like, we have these, I have this plaque on my desk. You can tell I like woodworking. Um, it says, we exist to help creators earn a living. Um, uh, Hillary, my wife is like, are you gonna make, you know, things in your shop that don't say create in one form or another? And I'm like, mm, <laughs> we'll see. Um, but it started turning into this much bigger brand, right? And we're being used by musicians and artists and so much more. And ConvertKit felt pretty like techie, you know? And so I had this idea of like, we're going to change the name of the company. Um, and four years ago, I like told the team that we we're going to do that. And we started this long search to find a name. Um, and we wanted to find a name that fit with a mission. And we eventually found this word, um, Seva, um, S-E-V-A, uh, that means selfless service. And we love that idea of, you know, we're here to serve creators and help them earn a living. And the best creators are the ones that are really focused on serving their audience who don't see it as like, oh, you're 10,000 rows on my email list, but instead see it as I'm here to help you learn this, how to you know, launch a company, build a business, improve your life, better habits, all these things, right? They're there to serve their audience. And so I thought, um, oh man, uh, like this word, um, Sevo is so perfect for it. And the domain wasn't available, but it was owned by like a domain investor. And so uh, we bought it. They started at $500,000. We ended up buying it for 310,000. It was this whole thing. Um, Rebranded, I announced it on stage at our conference, the whole thing. And then afterwards, we learned that there was a whole bunch of research that we had glossed over. Um, And that like, it doesn't, the word doesn't just mean uh, service, but in um, Sikh culture, it's like, it, it's sacred. It, it's like the highest form of, of service. It, it's so, so important. People were like, you're taking this thing that means so much to us and you're using it for a marketing product. Right. Like, um, and, and so then, you know, we launched that July 1st, uh, 2008, 2018, um, and then uh, uh, like two weeks in, we realized we can't, we can't do this. We can't push ahead with this, you know, not only is it cultural appropriation, but it's also, um, you know, like sacred to a religion held by hundreds of millions, if not a billion people, you know? And so you know, like that, that's not okay. And so we ended up rolling the whole thing back um, crazy backlash from both sides, people saying that we right. gave into social justice warriors, um, everything else. But it basically came down to what are our values? How are we going to make the decision? And, um, you know, anyway, you can read the whole story, nathanberry.com. Um, it's wild and it's a hot thing now. There's a specific conversation where the guy who was, you know, I, I guess I assume Sikh guy yeah. was like talking to you and he, and you, you were like, uh, you know, how, what's the most respectful way we can use it, right? right. And you're like planning on still using it. And he's like, uh, you know, I really don't think you should, but like, you know, out of Seva, like I will help you figure that out. Right. And that was the moment that changed your mind, right? Yeah, because I was thinking maybe as we, maybe there's a, a path forward, right? Because I was thinking sunk costs, like there's no way we can go back. And so from that sunk cost perspective, I was thinking about, um, how can we do this in the most respectful way possible and incorporate these viewpoints? And so I was asking this person, like, will you help us do that? And he, and he really thought about it because he was trying so hard to convince us, like, please do not do this. And when I asked him and he said, okay, because like this other meaning of Seba is giving without the expectation of anything in return, like truly selfless service. And he said, okay, like that, that would be an act of Seba for me. Like, I'll do it. And when he said that, I realized, like, I just got this little flash of, oh, wow. That's, I, I think I am starting to understand what this word means. And if we want to embrace the term and make it a part of our company and all of that, then like the single best way that we could live out Seva is by taking this, this name that we got and giving it back and saying, okay, we, we made a mistake. That wasn't. Yeah the right direction. And, uh, and actually after that is when we added default to generosity as one of our core values in the company is inspired from, from that. 
I love that. Well, I think ConvertKit is a really good name. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> Um, and we're going to okay. say convert kit. <laughs> Great. <So. laughs> That's oh, a crazy man. story. I think everyone should read that blog post. It's on nathanberry.com, right? Yeah. Nathanberry.com slash rename. Got it. Um, so we've basically monopolized the entire Q&A session, but maybe in the time remaining, we can take a couple of questions. So if you have any questions, just pop it into the Q&A. The first one that I think is really interesting um, that I'll start off with is from Kieran who asks, um, documenting your work for the world to see seems like a great way to build a brand. How do you balance working in public and paying it forward to your audience with practical knowledge versus keeping strategy and key insights hidden away from competitors? Um, so I've definitely had competitors say, hey, thank you for the public barometrics page. Like that's really helpful. Um, <laughs> and my approach is, is basically that that's fine. Um, you know, email marketing is one of the most competitive spaces on the internet. I think we could sit here and list off 20 or 25 companies that are in the email marketing space and well over 10 million a year in revenue. Um, and I, I basically think that that's okay. If competitors know my whole playbook, that's fine. Um, and even act on it. Like we saw, you know, a big thing that we've done over the last two or a year and a half is launch a free plan, build out a new landing pages component, go from there. Uh, and a few weeks ago, we saw Aweber, you know, launch, build out, launch landing pages um, with a free plan. And we we're like, cool, our playbook is pretty good. Like, good job. Um, and it's just, that's how it works. And so I, I don't worry about that. I think the upsides from teaching everything you know and sharing publicly far, far outweigh any risk of a competitor, you know, getting ahead of you on something. They also like, <laughs> um, one thing that I like to internalize is none of my business strategies are that brilliant. They're usually the logical conclusion of what's going on in the market, our strengths as a company, and you know where the economy is going or something. And so you're like coming up with a brilliant plan, and it's like so like us launching commerce. It is the logical conclusion of everything we've been doing up at, up until this point. You know, it's not some like brilliant strategy or something like that that we had to worry about a competitor figuring out. Totally. Should we do another question? We, we yes, maybe have time for just a few more. Maybe let's treat it kind of like light and fire. Yeah, let's yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Um, view on the trust relationship between creators and their audience and balancing that with monetization. I love this question. Yeah, so you need to monetize your audience in a way that builds more trust, right? So if, if I turn on this, this method of earning a living, is it going to make me more trustworthy or less trustworthy? Uh, neutral or less trustworthy, don't do it. So here's examples, uh, right? The book, more trustworthy for sure. Paid newsletter, probably more trustworthy because ooh, all of a sudden this content is mm -hmm. good enough. If everyone else is paying for it, I should like read it in more detail and pay, pay more attention to it. Um, sponsorships can go either way, right? Some sponsorships, you're like, whoa, they got Lowe's to do a deal with them or they got, you know, whoever it is, right? Um, that makes you more trustworthy. Other ones where it's like, why are you taking money from that person? Makes right. you less trustworthy. It's so off brand, yeah. Yeah. So I would just map that, map that out because um, it can be totally what different. What about merchandise? Selling sweatshirts and t-shirts and things like that? I think usually more trustworthy. Um, oh. it, it probably depends. I'm not in like a lot of the YouTuber um, space where maybe that might be especially popular. Mm -hmm. But I think of it as, you know, you leveled up in a way. Mm -hmm. um, an, an example, this might be controversial and I don't think it'd be controversial in these circles, but um, anything that's like the network marketing, multi-level marketing might be a great way to make money, but in my book, way less trust, like you're tanking your brand pretty quickly um, yeah. when you do that. So I, I would just, you know, map out the pros and cons of it and realize that there's plenty of ways to monetize that increase trust. Love it. Love Lee, that. Do you want to pick a last one? Sure. Okay. Um, let's go with question from Vishal. If you had to build a new company for creators today, what would you build that's not email marketing? Okay, well, this might be cheating because it's the company it's, that we are building. I would get closer to the money. I would build a, a payments platform. Um, and that's, that is what we're doing with ConvertKit Commerce. Um, it's really, really incredible to see people build their email list, build an audience, make that happen. It's so much cooler to watch them make money. Like yeah. there's this 
um, you know, like one example, there's this YouTube channel called the science mom and she just came out with a $10 free or not $10. Uh, t- yeah. A $10 workshop on teaching uh, physics with paper airplanes. And she launched that on convert commerce. It sold like $4,000 worth like immediately. And you're just like, this is so cool. Um, and so, yeah, I would be totally involved in everything around helping creators earn money. I feel like Patreon's figured out some stuff. Substack has figured out some stuff. Gumroad and ConvertKit. Everyone's trying to tackle this problem. And in certain areas, it is getting solved, but there's still so much room. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and I actually think Patreon in particular hasn't like quite figured out the model. The other thing is I think all everyone is trying to charge way too much. Um, you know, of like charging. Like a cut of revenue, you mean? Yeah, I think you have to be much closer to the three, three and a half, four percent range than the 10, 12, eight percent range that other platforms are at. So otherwise, um, I think you're uh, what the creator wants and then what you want as a platform start to diverge over time. And Nathan, you and I have talked about this quite a bit. Um, and that you have an entire post on this, I believe, right? of making sure that those incentives are aligned so that that partnership can work, not just this year, but five years from now. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, two reasons why they probably charge too much is that a, a lot of them are venture backed and they need to show that they can charge. Mm -hmm. And B, I think a lot of them would like to believe that they're driving incremental audience growth for the creators and that it's not just a tool. Um, well, and I think if we take Substack for a second, I, I think a lot of people are looking at Substack's features and saying like, this mm-hmm. isn't worth, you know, 12.9% that they're charging. And they're evaluating that today. And I think a lot of the team at Substack would be like, but yes, we're not driving audience growth today, but like six months from now, we have all of these plans. A year from now, we have all of, all of these plans. And so it is hard and, and any tool that you sell, right? you know, you have this vision for where it's going to go and then what you're charging for it today. And, and there ends up being a disconnect and you're like, no, but trust us on this journey and then that value will be delivered. And so I think Substack will build out a lot of great distribution features. And so then you just have to decide if that's worth it. Yeah. Totally. All right. So there's people in the comments asking us to go on for another hour, but we try to be really respectful of people's time and it's a Friday afternoon. So perhaps one day we'll get Nathan Berry back on the show. Um, But in the meantime, where can people reach you or read your writing or find you on the internet? Yeah, so uh, my writing is at nathanberry.com. There's a newsletter box you can sign up. I send a newsletter every Tuesday. Um, Actually, if you sign up there, I'm working on a new uh, paid course um, called The Art of Newsletters. So taking everything we've learned from building newsletters, helping people like James Clear and Tim Ferriss and, you know, all of that build the biggest newsletters in the web. Um, Putting that that. all together. Um, Nathan, I want to interview you for it. So, you know, since we're doing this on air, um, you have to say yes. (laughs) Um, I'm in. uh, So anyway, that'll be there. Uh, And then I also do a podcast uh, every Monday and Friday live um, called The Future Belongs to Creators. Uh, You can go to uh, youtube.com slash convertkit for that. And that actually amazing. goes live in 27 minutes. So oh, amazing. Love it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nathan, for being here today and being such a great guest. Uh, I think we all learned so much and it was really enjoyable. And thank you guys in the audience for joining us today and stay tuned for when we upload it to YouTube and create a podcast out of it. Thank you again for being here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. See you guys. See ya. All right. Bye. Have a great weekend.